Uh, okay, so why is this important? Well, the ring is actually useful for deriving other results that we'll be running, in, we'll be running into quite a bit over the course of the semester. Uh, one situation is the electric field of a uniformly charged disk. Put that down here. So let's say you have a circular disk, say a piece of plastic or something like that, and again, it has a radius, and we're putting it in the xy plane. And you can see it's coming out. Only now it's solid. Okay, so this is a kind of hard to draw indicator, but it's a solid disk, and it has a uniform, again, we'll say positive charge spread over the entire surface. And we want to do the same thing. We want to calculate what the electric field is, magnitude of the electric field at some location on the z-axis. Okay. What do we do? Where, where can we start here? We want, what's the general procedure? The procedure is we Break into pieces, right? Break the charge distribution into pieces, each with a size of charge delta Q, and then draw the delta E. Well, in the previous cases, we've been breaking it up into pieces that have looked like point charges. But what might be a better choice in this case? We could bring it, break it up into concentric rings, couldn't we? We could say this disk is nothing more than just a series of concentric rings, okay? And if we look at one single ring, and I'll try to color it in just so it's a little easier to see. Let's say we look at one slice, one thin ring out of this disk. Here's a thin ring that's positively charged. The electric field due to that ring is pointing in what direction at that location? In the positive z direction, right? Along, same as it was in, the, in that case, right? So that's our delta E. So what am I going to get when I add all those up? What am I going to get for my result? The electric field is going to be pointing in the positive z direction because all the delta E's are going to be pointing in the same direction. So we get a situation that looks like this. We can just model the electric field, uh, or excuse me, model the uh, the disk as a series of concentric rings. So here's ring number one, and you probably can't see it, but there's a tiny little electric field at, at the origin there, at the observation location. Electric field number two, and we keep adding up the delta E. So there is uh, delta E2 plus delta E1 gives us our total delta E so far. Ring slice number three increases the electric field, then slice number four, slice number five, six, seven. We keep on going and going until we get, it goes off the screen here, but we get a uniformly charged, positively charged, in this case, ring, where the electric field in each, for each little slice is pointing directly away, okay? So that makes it kind of easy to visualize. What about actually doing the calculation? Well, you have to go through the same steps. We have to, we've, we've picked our delta Q. We then have to write delta E in terms, or uh, write an expression for delta E, I guess we should say more generally, write expression for delta E. When you're doing it analytically, we said it's often in terms of the integration variable, right? So let's look at this disk. We have a disk that is has a radius capital R, 
And there is one little slice of this disk. And this little slice is not, could be any distance away, right? So this, this little ring is, we'll call little r, to indicate the radius of the particular ring, not, the, not capital R, the total radius of the disk. Okay, and then we have z. So what's the integration variable? What changes as we move from one ring to the next? Which r? Little r. Little r is the thing that's changing, right? So we're going to write a summation uh, in terms of little r, okay? So we have the electric field. Really, it's just the z component, but that's the only component we have here. Delta E is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Delta Q, which is the charge of the, ri the ring. Q is the charge of the whole disk. Delta Q times Z over is it capital R squared plus Z squared to the 3 halves, just like in the formula for the ring? It'd be little r. Wouldn't it be little r? Because we're looking at the electric field due to one of its little slice, one little piece of that ring. Okay? So we're not, if I use capital R, that would tell me a ring right at the outer edge. But we want a variable here that's going to be changing as we move from one ring to the next, right? So that's our, our uh, expression. We want a delta Q in terms of delta r. This requires a little bit of geometry here. We have to think about the number of or the area of the disk is equal to n times the area of a ring. And the same would be uh, or we can say that the total charge is equal to n times delta Q. So as usual, if we can figure out this relationship, we can then sub or do a division and then figure out delta Q in, in terms of delta R. So what's the area of the total disk? What's the area of a circle? Pi R squared. So I would say the area of a disk is pi times which R? The area of the entire disk would be pi times big R squared, right? Okay. How do we figure out the area of a thin ring? Any ideas? There's nothing inside here, so it's just the area of this little slice, right? Okay, the area of the outer circle minus the area of the inner, that, that would work. Let's see if we can do that. We would have pi times r squared, let's do it this way, pi times r plus delta r squared. If I say that this is, this is r and this is delta r plus delta r, we're going a little bit farther out as we go from one to the, uh, the sort of the inner radius to the outer radius, minus pi r squared, okay? That could give us the area of the of the, um, uh, of the slice, okay, of that ring, and it's a little bit tricky because you have here we already have pi r squared. There's a lot of algebra here. R squared plus two r times delta r uh, plus delta r squared minus pi r squared. Well, let's see. The r pi r squared is going to cancel out. And then we have 2 pi r times delta r plus a pi delta r squared. Well, it turns out that this term kind of goes away. And the reason is because you have a delta r, which is a tiny little number. If you square a tiny little number, you get an even tinier little number. So really, it's only this term that matters. And the way you can think about this is you have the circumference, 2 pi r, the distance around, times the thickness. So we have a length times the thickness giving us an area of that, uh, of that uh, thin ring. Okay? 
So really, 2 pi r times delta r is the area of the ring that we want. And so I'm sort of hand-waving around this, but it's, it's just making sort of an approximation. So we have pi r squared then is equal to n times 2 pi little r times delta r. And we have then q is equal to n times delta pi or delta q. So we can say then that uh, q over pi capital R squared is equal to delta q over 2 pi r delta r or delta q then is q over pi r squared times 2 pi little r delta r. And we have a pi that goes away and a factor of 2 here. So we have 2q over r squared delta r. Okay. We finally go through all that geometry. We can then plug that back into the formula and, and do the integral. Okay. And as usual, I'm not going to do the integral. I'm just going to give you the result. We have an integral of more room here. An integral from zero to what? Big R, right? We're going from the center to the very outmost edge. One over four pi epsilon zero. We have two capital Q over little R, or excuse me, over cap over R squared, capital R squared. Uh, I lost the little r here. There's a little r here. So we have q, little r in the, in the numerator. Uh, we have a z in the numerator, and we have r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. Okay, so it looks pretty ugly. But a lot of stuff is a, is a constant. Basically, all this is a constant, and the z is a constant. So you're integrating r over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. You do that integral, you end up with a rather ugly looking expression, which is Q over A, and I'll tell you what A is in a second, divided by 2 epsilon 0 times all this stuff in parentheses here. Let me get rid of this. 1 minus Z over square root of capital R squared plus z squared, where a is the area of the disk. And the area of the disk, we said, is uh, pi times capital R squared. Okay. So this expression here is the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field of a uniformly charged disk. Uh, and again, the, we're on the center axis. Distance z away, radius capital R. Well, that's kind of ugly. And it's, it, it's precise, but kind of a mess to plug things into. So let's see if we can make some approximations. So let's write this again. We have area of the disk, Q over A, 2 epsilon 0, 1 minus Z over square root R squared plus Z squared. So here is our, let's, I'm going to draw my disk sort of edge on here. So I'm looking, this isn't, this isn't a rod, this is actually sort of a, a, a perspective or an edge on view of a, of a disk. Positively charged disk, we'll say. And here's the radius. So it's capital R. And what if we want to find the electric field at a location where Z is very close? So the approximation that Z is much less than R. Okay. Well, Z is much less than R. R squared plus Z squared is approximately just going to be R squared. Okay. Square root of R squared is just going to give me R, right? So I can write an approximate formula 
electric field of a disk is equal to Q over A over 2 epsilon 0, 1 minus Z over R. Okay? So that's a lot more simple. Uh, and often the case, we are looking at situations where we're very close to a charged disk, and so it might be more useful to us as well. And in fact, if you're really close, if Z is much, 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 much less than R, what does Z over R become? Zero, right? So we might even be able to get away with just saying the electric field of a disk is Q over A over 2 epsilon zero. And that's really simple. And it also kind of gives a better sense of what the electric field looks like when we are that close to the disk. We essentially have a situation where if we're close enough, we're not getting too far away, the field just depends on the charge, depends on the area, and it's got a constant down here. This epsilon zero is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 in units of uh, Coulomb squared over Newton meters squared. So it's just a fundamental constant, the charge of the disk and the area. There's no dependence on the distance away. So provided I'm close enough, the field essentially looks uniform. We have the same magnitude here as maybe just slightly further away, the same magnitude there. And it's also a fairly good approximation over the entire, or not the entire, but a lot of the area of the disk, okay? And much like with the case of the rod, it's only when you start to get toward the edge that the approximation breaks down and you start to get effects that look like that. So the field looks uniform both in magnitude and in direction when you're close to the center part of uh, the electric field of a disk. And that's kind of a useful thing to, to know. If we want to create a uniform field, then maybe having a uh, electric uh, or uniformly charged disk would be, uh, would be the most useful thing to have. Okay? Questions? So a bunch more derivation, but it just gives us a, a nice result that we can pull out of our pocket when we, uh, when we see a situation like this. Yes, uh, but you will have to understand when they're useful, okay, and what approximations go into them. Okay, so you don't want to use, if you're at a situation where you have, like, if you have a, a rod and you are, you know, very far away, you don't want to use the, the 1 over R formula. But if you're close enough, you might be able to use that formula. In similar situation here, right? Other questions?